Uh, Will is going to speak for about 15 minutes. Uh, then he's going to be asked a few questions by Tom Brake, who's the UD director. You know, hi, Tom, to you as well. Then it's over to you, the audience, to ask some questions. So with all of those introductions out of the way, uh, Will, please do start when you're ready. OK, good evening, everybody. Um, I, I was a fan. I was a uh, a founder signatory of Charter 88 and sat on the council back in the day. Um, that was 33 years ago. And in fact, um, the, it was um, part of the genesis of the state we're in because um, those with long memories, you can remember the book. I mean, it was three pronged. It was both an attack on um, uh, what fascism had done and, and making a case for stakeholder capitalism. It was making the case for a new social settlement. But it was also saying that everything had to be housed in a reframed British constitution. And it caught the, as you all know, I mean, to my amazement, the original print run was three and a half thousand and it sold over 300,000 copies in the end. Um, and I was reflecting on the state run as I heard Donald, Don, you know, Dominic Cummings speaking yesterday, crackers, he said, that someone uh, like him uh, had risen so high and crackers that the British people's choice was Boris Johnson or Jeremy Corbyn. Um, and, you know, I kind of tweeted out that, that whatever you may think of Dominic Cummings, I think there he spoke, I thought, searingly honestly about that um, and about the um, uh, kind of inadequacies, inadequacies of the British state, which um, is simultaneously kind of uh, with its still kind of mon monarchical structure too powerful at the center. But, but also curiously, um, notwithstanding all the executive power it has, kind of um, weak, um, uh, there's kind of multiple kind of multiple ways in which power can be held. Um, it's very difficult to kind of make things happen. Um, and then over and above that, as I'm going to detail in the next kind of minute or two, um, the, 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 the kinds of principles that you would want to um, enthuse that, the 1995 Nolan principles of public life, selflessness, integrity, objectivity, accountability, openness, honesty, everyone knows them. I mean, how uh, easy it is kind of um, uh, given British uh, part, the interaction of um, what it means to have a majority in the House of Commons kind of interacting um, with this strong but weak state kind of leads to the kinds of things that we have lived through. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, just briefly, I mean, I, I, I do think it's, I do think that, uh, I also want to say something else for everyone to hold in mind. Um, uh, it's now uh, a commonplace, which wasn't a commonplace when I wrote the state we're in, but it's now a commonplace that um, no form of capitalism um, can be permitted to, to continue in an unfettered way. And you simply have to, have, at the very least, um, a public-private partnership, at the very least, um, kind of um, state frameworks in which capitalism can take place, uh, and you have to have a thinking state, a nimble state, a, a state with capacity to act uh, and 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 acts around those Nolan principles. This isn't just a elementary fairness of everyone on this call, um, but it's also about uh, kind of doing effectively to make civilization work the better. Um, and I, you know, I've argued this all my career and I argue it still. Um, but just, I, I just think it's worthwhile rehearsing. Um, you all know this, but when you, when you put it together as, I, as kind of researching the, the few things I was going to say this evening, I just as, as astonishing kind of, you know, the cumulative impact of it is really quite something. I mean, just think, I think someone's probably not got their mic um, on mute. There's, a, there's some noise coming through, but don't worry if you just click your mic on mute. Um, just think, let, let's just think about the, kind of the, the casual way um, in which um, permanent secretaries have been cowed um, by um, Johnson and by, by, by Cummings. Um, I mean, astonishing, the kind of sacking of the cabinet secretary. And what happened to Philip Rutman at the Home, the home Secretary, uh, the, at the Home Office, when um, he challenged the Home Secretary over bullying. 
Um, just think about the resignation of Sir Alex Allen, who was the, um, the Prime Minister's advisor on um, kind of ministerial standards. Um, his advice was um, only written actually on one page that we were allowed to ever see. Um, he resigned over the refusal of Johnson to implement um, his recommendations over, over um, Preeti Patel. Think of the degree to which um, the government has used ministerial directions to overrule um, civil services. Think extraordinary about. I don't know. It's very sure I can put this down. The, the way public contracts have been, um, you know, the PP contracts, uh, the high priority lane that the National Audit Office uh, uncovered in its audit um, some months back and made it 10 times more likely if you're in a, in a high priority lane to get awarded a contract. And everybody in the high priority lane was either a donor to the Conservative Party or a friend of a minister, famously Matt Hancock. And think of the scandal over the public first consultancy, the award of a kind of juicy contract with absolutely kind of no competitive framework. Then kind of the way appointments has been run. I mean, I, I mean, we heard this morning they're going to rerun the Ofcom appointment so they can get Paul Dacre in to be chair, I suspect. But I mean, I, I was very, very shocked by um, the way Lord Wharton of Yarn, um, kind of 35 year old ex Tory MP, who was put into um, the kind of the structure of the, um, of the um, intervening panel, um, kind of full of um, Tory placemen uh, like Nick Timothy. Um, to become chair of the office for students whose job is to conduct to kind of conduct the culture war the, uh, the war on woke that actually the government thinks kind of is advantageous to it think of baroness dido harding kind of running the test and trace and what a fiasco that was think also the way in which um, just recently um charlie dunstone who's, who's no kind of um liberal um a, 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 a tory donor and founder of carphone warehouse resigned from being chair of the um, Greenwich Museum um, because um, the culture secretary refused to reappoint a trustee. Um, look at the way the House of Lords has been kind of packed um, with not particularly um, distinguished Tories, all of them kind of, uh, a, a, a goodly many of them, um, they're reciprocally for, the, for, for favors. Think of, think of the extraordinary business over Greens Hill, um, Lex Greens Hill, and the way in which he um, had a seat in the, in the cabinet office. Um, and actually, um, uh, I, mean, I, I was sad to see that um, uh, Jeremy Hayward, a man who I've got a great deal of time for, um, uh, had actually, I think, uh, kind of facilitated that. And also actually um, facilitated the takeover of, um, um, so, um, arm, a high-tech company by SoftBank, uh, because when he had appeared out of office um, and working for Morgan Stanley, um, his, his boss uh, um, founded a, a, a boutique investment bank, Sir Simon Roby, um, that badly wanted the business. And I've no doubt that um, uh, finding a way through um, the regulatory maze to allow SoftBank to get at arm was enabled by um, Jeremy Hayward. Um, Think of the way that the, uh, the, the whistleblowing capacity, uh, the National Audit Office, it, it produces these reports. I mean, um, I thought some of its work is, is very, very high quality, but what's its, what's its ability to make its report stick? Um, uh, is, there any, is there any compulsion on the, on the government to kind of accept its recommendations? And Lord Geit, who succeeded Alex Allen as the, um, uh, Kind of, um, of advice, advisor on ministerial standards. I mean, uh, he he only can have um, his investigations initiated by the prime minister, and the prime minister um, can use executive discretion and royal prerogative powers uh, to ignore recommendations he may make. And um, you know, famously marking one's own homework. This marking one's own homework character of the British state kind of is, and here you know, and those of you. Who, Kind of long memories and read the rights of man. I mean, Tom Paine, you know, writing in the end of the 18th century, um, in front of the American Revolution, observed that the character of the British state in the kind of 1780s was recognizably the same uh, as um, William the Conqueror had, had created. 
And you can make exactly the same point, you know, 250 years after Tom Paine. I mean, it's, uh, you know, um, William the Conqueror would, would recognize um, the, the structures of the British state um, and the degree to which um, power is centralized um, in the hands of um, the executive um, in the person of the crown. Um, and one of the problems about um, refusing to face the kind of reality of, I mean, we, um, uh, you know, the ongoing kind of existence of the royal family and that, um, I mean, it's not that I object to the royal family, who can object to them uh, or object to a life of public service of the queen. But what, what one can object to is the nature of the executive power that the royal family necessarily lend to whoever holds the majority in the House of Commons, um, which kind of gets to this kind of marking one's own homework. And as we saw um, in 2019, um, you know, a, at the Privy Council, three Privy Councils were able to fly to Balmoral and advise the Queen to prorogue Parliament for five and a half weeks for no better reason than actually the, um, the, the uh, Mr. Johnson at that point lost control of the House of Commons. Think of the Henry VIII powers on trade deals. I mean, I'm, I'm astonished by this deal with Australia, which Liz Trussett um, um, acknowledges will lead to um, a seven or eight percent increase in British exports to Australia over the next uh, 15 years, the 83 percent rise of Australian exports to Britain. I mean, zero tariffs, zero quotas um, on goods means if you're weak in goods, as we are, um, you're always going to be um, kind of at the receiving at the wrong receiving end of this, and unless one does kind of a kind of smart deal on services, but the House of Commons has absolutely no power to insist on that because it's been denied it by the exercise of executive discretion. And it gets darker. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm astonished actually by the way in which um, the Conservative Party kind of borrowing from the Republican um, kind of playbook in the States is now kind of, um, I mean, the, the, the uh, twin attack and the ID cards to vote, um, um, where does that come from? I mean, the number of um, fraud cases, one, two, or three, um, but disenfranchising uh, up to two million voters, um, many of whom will be Labour voters. Also, you know, the, 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 the attack in, uh, in tandem with it on actually trying to reduce the number of graduates coming out of our universities, particularly in humanities, where um, grants are going to be, and, and kind of subventions to the HE sector are going to be cut by up to 50%. They tend to vote Labour and stay in university towns which vote Labour or Lib Dem. That can't be allowed any more than, as George Osborne famously told Nick Clegg, um, it wasn't, and he wasn't in favour of building council houses because um, uh, they, uh, the denizens voted Labour. Um, and I think the simple, the simple majoritarianism that comes with our, with our lack of thought about what our constitution is, uh, I mean, having a, I mean, the, the, a, such a narrow majority to under um, the, the, the kind of our relationship with the European Union kind of is bound to be, is bound to be without writing in the necessity of having a supermajority, is bound to be extraordinarily divisive. And if the Scots ever get a referendum and actually vote by a narrow majority to sunder a, a more than 300 year relationship with, the, with England uh, and Wales, I mean, uh, that'd be pure poison um, in Scotland thereafter. You need a supermajority uh, actually um, to, to navigate profound changes in, in the character of the state in which you live. Um, and then you have um, the way in which the first past the post system reflects on the, and the hero, and Dominic Cummings is right. I mean, I, you know, um, too many constituencies in Britain are frankly rotten boroughs. I mean, at least 250 Tory constituencies uh, are almost never going to change hands. And um, certainly that's true up to 150 Labour constituencies, so bigger than the majorities. And you know, what that leads to is that the, a narrow group of men and women in those constituencies essentially nominate uh, an MP who is going to be kind of there for life as long as he or she wants to be there and doesn't commit some heinous crime. I mean, um, you know, the, we abolished rotten boroughs in 1832 in the Great Reform Act. I would argue that we have up to 500 rotten boroughs um, in, um, in 2021. Um, some constituency associations on the Tory side, uh, no more than 100 people nominating an MP um, and um, who will, uh, 
and all they have to do is to say is, is to swore fealty to Mrs. Thatcher, um, hatred of the European Union, and promise to lower taxes. And the hundred people, typically over seventy, will kind of like nodding donkeys, um, confer the nomination to that person. And it leads to kind of, I, I think it leads, those of you who haven't should certainly read Sasha Squire's extraordinary um, account, a diary that she kept, um, diary of an MP's wife. Um, her husband, Hugo Squire, was a secretary, was a minister of state in the foreign office and in Northern Ireland. And, and, and as a Etonian, a, a part of the David Cameron coterie. And the account she gives of the kind of, the kind of frivolous way in which um, austerity was launched, the frivolous way in which um, baubles um, were handed out, um, you know, a, a, pro, um, a job here, um, a chairmanship of this, uh, and the uh, given the seriousness of what austerity was actually going to do to us, um, uh, as we witnessed in the pandemic, kind of disabling so much of local government and so much of central government, the capacity to act. But I mean, it's just, I mean, the, the, <laughs> It, it produces a, a, a kind of a culture of levity um, in which and here I do think that um, some of the critics um, who've emerged um, uh, like Sathan Sanghera, who has written this rather interesting book, a kind of empire land, who make the connection between the structure of the British state and the way that, um, you know, um, dominions and colonies were administered um, is not dissimilar actually to the way Britain is now administered. I sometimes think, um, that England really is um, the last colony, and actually the, the kind of frivolous way, um, in the way insiders kind of um, manage um, our affairs, um, uh, really trying to keep the natives down. And actually, I mean, Boris Johnson's famous line, quoted yesterday by Dominic Cummings, that let the, let the, the bodies pile higher, is not dissimilar to um, successive governor generals of uh, India uh, in the way they felt about kind of repressing the natives in the wake of the Indian mutiny and, and right up, I mean, General Eyre and the famous Amritsa massacre was indulged by the governor general in so those kind of terms. And it, it kind of speaks to a, um, a kind of lack of democracy, but actually a kind of a, a culture in which, um, you know, that those above us um, kind of govern and we are subordinate to them. And of course, the great public schools that produced the people that ran empire are now the great public schools um, who now kind of run us. Um, I sometimes think that Eaton has flipped from kind of producing people who would run India and kind of Africa and large parts of Asia to kind of running us. And actually in, in the same kind of frivolous way. And whether it's Brexit, um, whether it's the handling of the pandemic um, and whether it's things that um, may not kind of um, um, particularly you may not find problematic but I think it's extraordinary that we live in a country um, in which you know you, you pay your rates on residential property values and they haven't been revalued for 30 years and this is the kind of thing which happens in kind of Ruritania in banana republics but it also happens in a state where actually um, our governors are too are too frightened of how the natives might react um, and there's not a process for kind of deliberation and iteration or discussion about why you can't do that. We can't have it that, you know, the, the rates are paid in 20, 30 years time on the basis of what property was worth in 1991. Um, you know, democratic failures uh, and dysfunctions of the type that we're living through are, are all around. It's, it's, in, it's in the failure ever to successfully level up. It's, it's in the failure to have, um, to sort out our social care um, system. It's really, kind of comes right down to um, the condition of the people. And there plainly has to be a kind of a new settlement. Um, I'm running out of time. I have kind of four planes on which I, my own thinking is, and, I'd, and in the discussion that we'll have, a, you know, in the next kind of 40 minutes, I mean, I think we'll be quite interesting to focus on these planes. I think plane one, I think it's the whole question of actually um, how we make the process of state structures kind of live the kind of Nolan principles. Um, and that I think is about, I mean, it's everything from um, paying people properly. Um, uh, it's um, really having kind of proper independence in the, um, we, we need to collapse uh, the Committee of Standards on Public Life and the, um, the kind of business, of the, of the business appointments process uh, into one 
kind of regulator um, that has the statutory kind of right to kind of elect to, to independently kind of investigate what's going on and actually levy fines and actually at the limit um, there should be prison sentences um, for people who kind of um, traduce um, um, the, the standards that we expect in, in high public office. Um, you know, I, you know, I, I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's a sacred thing um, holding high office. It's a sacred thing being able to disperse public money. It's a sacred thing. Um, uh, uh, and I, uh, and, and the levity and the, the chaps like us um, can be relied upon to behave properly when palpably they can't. I really think that there's a whole kind of plane there. You may have ideas about what to do. There's just a few I've kind of outlined. The second plane on which I think um, is that um, a democracy is not just about voting. I will say something about the voting system in a minute. It is about a capacity to, to deliberate, it is about a capacity to have an iterative relationship with citizens. Um, uh, it is a capacity um, to have checks and balances. Um, and that reflects itself in, in having at least two, two chambers, both of which are elected. Um, it means there shouldn't be um, kind of monarchical power. Um, so you are, you are led inevitably, I think, in a, in a Republican direction. Um, uh, it's also, I think, um, yeah, uh, I don't want to put, come. Um, it's also, I think, having a um, kind of proper processes for ensuring that the appointments in the civil service and, and public appointments uh, are not are, are not kind of in the hands of uh, or in the in the gift of the prime minister. Even actually, bishops uh, in the Church of England. I mean, uh, this extraordinary business we're having at the minute, where um, trustees of um, of um, all public bodies, you know, museums, um, National Gallery, um, universities, uh, regulatory bodies like Ofcom or the Competition and Markets Authority, you can only be a Tory and you can only be a Brexit Tory to be considered. And I mean, I, ju I just think that as a, kind of a perspective uh, to make the kind of gene pool from which one's recruiting um, uh, to so small is incredibly kind of self-defeating. I'm, as people know, I'm a passionate believer in a federal structure for the country. I think it may be too late. It may be already too late. Um, maybe some people on the call from, from Scotland uh, may already be too late to persuade um, Scotland to stay um, in a relationship with England and Wales. I personally would regret that. Um, I don't really believe in, um, in, I'm afraid I don't really believe in, I mean, even though I think there is a civic nationalist tradition in Scotland, I don't, I don't really believe in nationalism. I really, um, uh, English nationalism has led to this kind of pit we're currently in, um, and Scottish nationalism, I'm, I'm sure, will be a, a kind of dead end too. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a Democrat, I'm a child of the Enlightenment. Um, uh, I believe in, in defining shared goals. I, I don't believe that, um, that uh, as some friends of mine who are passionate Scot Nats believe that um, everyone who's born and uh, comes out of the womb of a Scots uh, woman is necessarily uh, carrying the kind of um, DNA of the Sultan. I just, you know, find that kind of romantic nonsense and I'm very, very, I'm very, very problematic and poisonous. And lastly, voting. I mean, I, you know, I, I just think that um, a first past the post system um, produces the simple majoritarianism uh, and it goes hand in hand with all the kind of executive discretion that I've described. You know, all of it has to be, um, all of it has to be blown up um, and reworked. A word on when this ha will happen. I mean, I, I'm just being, I'm nearly finished Linda Colley's book, um, The Gun, The Ship and The Pen on the history of written constitutions. And if you haven't read it, I really recommend it to you. It's fantastically interesting. And, um, you know, re rewrites history for you. A basic thesis, is, is that written constitutions um, are the product of revolutions, of, of wars, um, of, of crises, when actually um, the state has to re-legitimize itself and kind of offer a deal um, to citizens uh, to kind of go forward. Um, and it may be that we're arriving at such a crisis in Britain. Um, um, it may be that keeping Scotland in the Union, it may be that um, the years of low growth and extraordinary kind of inequality that lie in front of us post-Brexit may be the trigger um, for a serious conversation about the Constitution.
but I have no doubt that we cannot go on as we are. Um, the events of the last 18 months are just proof positive of that. We must have change. Thank you for listening to me. I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Will. Thank you very much for that. That was wonderful. Can we go on to Tom? Uh, Tom, would you be able to start off the questions by asking Will um, three or four questions, please? Then we'll move on to questions from the audience, and we have a lot of them. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jess. So perhaps the first question, uh, Will, is that you set out uh, uh, quite a long list of things that were dysfunctional uh, uh, that had happened in the last 18 months, the last couple of years, perhaps like over a slightly longer time period than that. But you've been following political matters for uh, three or four decades. Hmm. Are, things, are things really much worse now than in previous sort of recent history in terms of, if I think back to... Uh, Neil Hamilton and Martin Bell and Cash for Questions, or if we look back to uh, John Major and back to basics, and equally I'm sure we could think of similar things happened under uh, governments of a different uh, persuasion. So are things really as bad as you have described, bearing in mind that the, the Economist Index still ranks the UK as a full democracy, uh, whereas for instance France has now been downgraded to a flawed democracy? Well, I mean, I, um, I mean, I, I don't think. I mean, um, good question, and I'm challenged by it um, because I did live. I mean, I, you know, what the genesis of Charter 88 was as a sense of um, Mrs. Thatcher taking an elective dictatorship to kind of new kind of borders and frontiers. And you're right, you know, kind of the question uh, kind of was kind of that came later, of course. The Nolan principles were um, uh, a, a direct result of kind of some of the kind of hazards that John Major's government kind of um, 1995 they came. Um, I, I do think that on two or three levels things are uh, uh, um, more problematic now than they were even 25 years ago. One, um, I, I, you know, the um, it's an extraordinary to live in a country that could break up. I mean that certainly wasn't the case. Um, in, you know, that's, that's something new. Um, secondly, I, mean, I think um, membership of the European Union and uh, an anxiety by um, even Tories um, to be careful with public money meant that public procurement um, uh, was done um, kind of rationally. I do think the Towns Fund, the way Robert Jenrick has dispensed um, that money to you know, 45 towns of which 40 were sitting Tory MPs and having to rewrite the, the, um, the, uh, the criteria on which uh, towns can apply um, so that they can be, they can include places like Richmond where Richie Sunak sits. I and mean, it's extraordinary, I think that's, that's new frontiers. Um, I do think, um, I, I do think that the um, willingness to use the state um, to reshape um, the electoral base. And we saw bits of it. I mean, you know, um, Shelley Porter in Westminster was trying to make sure that there'd always be, that Labour voters were focused in some borough, in some wards, as you may remember. And she, she paid for that with a, a kind of, I mean, she had to leave public office and um, very, very sad kind of story. But I mean, now that's gone kind of national. Um, I think that's a kind of step up. All these things seem to me to be kind of writ larger um, than they were. I mean, and the and there was. I, I mean, within the Conservative Party, um, they there were in, in in a Conservative cabinet, of Mrs. Thatcher's cabinet, in John Major's cabinet. I mean, um, men like Ken Clark and Michael Heseltine, and women like Virginia Bottomley, were kind of you know, uh, they couldn't they couldn't they wouldn't and they wouldn't serve under Boris Johnson. Um, uh, um, uh, I mean, they weren't liars, they weren't deceitful. Um, and within their lights, they were extraordinarily honorable and really believed in public duty. You know, and when I look at, you know, um, um, kind of Liz Truss, Jenrick, uh, um, I, mean, you know, I don't think Preeti Patel and Gavin Williamson should be, shouldn't be holding office. I mean, the Tory party, uh, Mrs. May was the last, tried to sack both, well, she did sack both Gavin Williamson and Preeti Patel. I mean, 
and that uh, Mrs. Thatcher would have done the same. It, uh, this kind of willingness to put the Praetorian Guard around ministers, which Boris Johnson goes in for, that's something new. So I do think it's a different level. Okay, let's get, come to a, a question that is of interest, particular interest to uh, unlock democracy. And in fact, is the, the reason uh, I contacted you to ask you whether you would be willing to take part in that you support the idea of a written constitution. That is what unlock democracy uh, campaigns for. But to pick up on one of the questions in the chat, um, uh, the, the person in the chat was commenting on the fact, looking, looking at who, who is here tonight in terms of following this, and it is principally uh, an audience um, which is uh, more mature in terms of age. It is principally, I, I hope not completely, I, I know isn't completely uh, a white audience, but how do we broaden this agenda? How do we make things like a written constitution, democratic reform, something that people beyond the sort of person who's willing to take an hour out on, a, on an evening, a Thursday evening, to discuss these things. How do we take it to a much wider base than that? Uh, young people, uh, people from the ethnic minorities, to make this something that, that people will talk about and want to invest time in and perhaps even vote on the basis of. In other words, if a political party is talking about uh, significant reform, actually uh, that influences that how they are going to vote. How can we achieve that? Now, I, I'm, I'm, if people can still hear me, I'm not sure whether my question was too long-winded for Will and he's, he's suffered um, a sudden lapse, but um, I think we will uh, need to wait a few minutes uh, until we get uh, Will back on the call. Um, so clearly, uh, uh, as an organisation, we'll, we'll wait for Will to come back, but uh, as an organisation, we have, uh, since the, uh, the, the origins of Unlock Democracy, with uh, Charter 88 been campaigning for a written constitution, and there are uh, different views, and I think uh, Will has alluded to that about whether a written constitution, whether, for instance, now would be the right time to try to secure one. Some of you have, may have been on a call or a webinar uh, last week uh, with uh, Meg Russell from the Constitution Unit, uh, who was setting out that in her view, you need a, a uh, you can only uh, sort of draft and debate a written constitution. Uh, at the point when a country is relatively stable. Um, I think Will was advocating the opposite, that in fact written constitutions are something that emerged from perhaps the chaos of war. But I hope we have uh, Will back now. So Excuse me? Did, you, did you catch my question? Yes, 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 I'm here, right. yeah. I don't know why, I mean, maybe the, the, you know, the Zoom is breaking down over the 200 of us. Um, look, I mean, I... I, I uh, I think you should get Linda Colley on actually, uh, because I think she's, I think her book is extraordinary. Um, it's eye-opening. Um, and I think it's, it, 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 it's, um, it's intent, it's, I mean, I don't know how she would uh, manage to arrive at a point of convergence with Meg Russell's point of view. I mean, I think that, um, uh, I think a number of things are gonna happen simultaneously. I mean, I, I think that um, the death of the queen will throw open a question of whether, the, um, um, one should actually, the, the, the crown should pass straight to William, um, that, that'll be a live debate. There'll be a live debate then about, you know, what monarchical power we want. Um, there's a live debate about our relationship with Scotland. Um, and I do think actually that um, uh, some of the things that uh, are happening um, kind of in, uh, uh, you know, the kind of sheer brazenness of um, Johnson and his, um, I mean, he's been, he's ridden his luck, uh, but his luck will run out. And when, when, that, when that luck runs out um, and, the, and the tide goes out of the Johnson government, there will be some really horrible things that will want to be, that people want to talk about. And the Conservative Party will want to reinvent itself. Um, and when the party, of, the party of the right and the party of the left uh, will simultaneously be in, in in some kind of crisis, and I think I, that's a moment where I think that um, uh, 
these kind of arguments will run. Now, it may be that one has to go, I mean, I, um, it, maybe that one has to decide, you know, what you want to do first. It may be that we have to discuss kind of federalizing the country before we start talking about making the Nolan principles live. Um, it may be that one has to start talking about that before we start talking about a voting system. We may have to kind of get things in a sequence. But um, I have absolutely no doubt that over the next decade, though, um, um, we will move um, towards a written constitution. Whether we one moment, whether we'll have a constitutional convention and we write it, um, you know, as in Philadelphia in 1789, uh, I'm not sure. Um, uh, I mean, the European Union tried to do that in 2003 and it fell flat in its face. Um, I suspect the way we're gonna do it is actually um, in a very British way, um, leading towards something which actually is de facto a written constitution without there being a moment when it happens. But the crises are kind of, you know, the dysfunctionality and the crises are, um, are kind of so evident and, the, and, the, and, the, and it's so offensive to so many people that there will be, I think, a political response. Can I just ask one sort of, it was the first half of my question, which maybe your, your system was down and that is, uh, do you think that the, 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 the conditions that you've just described in terms of how we might arrive at the need for a written constitution, are those conditions going to be such that uh, a, a much wider audience than the audience that on this call tonight is actually going to be interested enough in that issue to factor that in, in terms of their considerations, their political considerations, for instance, about how they might vote in a future election? How do we make this relevant to young people or people, the people who are not on this call? I think, I mean, I, I, um, you know, what I, what, I mean, I, I'm going to sound very starry eyed here, um, but I, I don't underestimate um, British citizens, don't underestimate them. I mean, I think there's a certain amount of kind of despair. They won't take any, you know, they're, they're interested in bread and butter issues, they're interested in going down the pub, they're not interested in politics, you know, they couldn't give a damn. Uh, I don't buy that. Um, my father, um, after the war, was in charge of um, uh, 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 political education for British troops. And he, he used to say, you know, it was just astonishing, you know, you would, you know, you'd turn up at, uh, to, he'd, he'd expect 100, 200 troops to turn up, there'd be thousands, you know. Uh, of course, that was a moment, but the idea that ordinary men and women and are kind of um, kind of don't, don't take any interest in this, I think is I think it's uh, uh, I don't think it's right. I mean, I think what's what what what's what's problematic is actually is on is unlocking it. Um, I sometimes wonder whether you know um, you know people like uh, unlock democracy and people like me and some of the others that you've got. You know, why, why couldn't we have a kind of really kind of mass kind of social media campaign? I mean, I'm sure if one put together in a, in a kind of three or four kind of pages and supported it with um, st you know, stuff on Twitter and, you know, that you would convince, you know, uh, people that, I mean, the way in which the, the pandemic has been handled is a disgrace. I mean, tens of thousands of people have, have died who shouldn't have died. Now, that alone is enough to galvanize people. Uh, so I, I would don't despair, Tom. Don't despair. And I think that you should keep, you know, um, congratulations to you in actually keeping this debate alive and actually congratulating people on the call. I mean, and by the way, every single one of us, I always say this, but I think it's true. I mean, I, I lived through the 70s and I, uh, you know, began the 70s as a fairly kind of, kind of, um, I don't know, I, I, I would say I was unconstructed, but I mean, uh, a myriad of conversations with um, uh, women, kind of young, middle-aged and old, convinced me to kind of revise the way that I, a man, kind of kind of interacted and related to women. And women took the responsibility of changing the conversation about about sexuality and about feminism and about women's place in the world. And that was a damn amazing thing to live through. You know, if one actually owns this and actually is prepared to have the conversations, and you're passionate enough about it, you can change the terms of debate. You can change the terms of the way it comes from the ground up. 
Thank you very much, Will. I'm going to pass back to Jess, who is now going to, to choose some of the, the, the questions. But can I just say to, to the many, many people who have answer, uh, asked questions, uh, I'm afraid even if we had a further two hours with Will, unfortunately, we couldn't deal with all of them. But uh, Jess is going to do her best. So over to you, Jess. Yes, thank you very much. So I'm going to try and pick out a few that I think might be uh, the most pertinent or the most raised or something which I think perhaps hasn't been touched on. And before I pass on some of those to you, Will, then I'd actually like to ask everybody on the call a question, because right at the beginning, there was a question asked, which was about um, the police, police crime courts and sentencing bill. And, and uh, Laura, I think, uh, said, would we all be prepared to go out and protest about that, you know, depending on what way we would do it. Now, can I ask Grace then to spotlight gallery view, and you might all want to, to move to gallery view anyway. And, you know, so you'll be seeing a lot of other people. Could I ask you all on the call to wave, you know, supposing that you think, yes, I need to protest about this. Can you wave as much as you can right now so we can see each other? <laughs> Excellent. I am so reassured by the number of people I see waving. My screen is full of waving. Thank you. That is really reassuring, you know, to know that people are that passionate about it. So moving on then, Will, to the questions. Um, there were several which were asked about citizens, um, so citizens assemblies, citizens juries, citizens conventions, um so so Pradav asked this uh laura asked this just now alicia asked this and she particularly asked uh, about the timings of you know citizens convention especially considering the climate crisis so will what place do you think citizens juries and citizens assemblies and citizens conventions should have you know, how should they influence policy? You know, what place do they have, do you think? Well, I mean, I think they, I mean, you can't, you can't advocate, um, you know, someone like me, you know, can't argue, because uh, democracy is much more than just voting, you know, um, of course that's the coping stone, but a democracy is about kind of an ongoing discussion, it's about ongoing deliberation, Kind of ongoing putting facts in the public domain and reacting to them and actually um, and nor should the only people uh, who kind of kind of engage with that um, be those we vote into our national assembly so you know I, you know um, the strain answer it is it's profound I think and actually I would encourage unlock democracy to to do it I mean I don't I mean I yeah, I don't see, you know, getting the funding would be one thing and getting legitimacy is another. But I, I do think that um, you can kind of imagine a world in which, uh, kind of in all our major cities and towns, there were um, uh, coming, a coming together in the way you describe. Uh, it would be extraordinary. It would be extraordinary. Um, and then, you know, it would, uh, and actually sooner or later, um, MPs and local councillors would have to take, would have to take note, you know, because they, you know, they want your vote. And so they need to be, they can't actually, politicians are in the vote business. I mean, in, in that respect, we are still a democracy. I mean, we are, you know, I mean, uh, uh, and it, I'm always struck by politicians about how kind of how much they care and properly so about where the votes are going to come from. Uh, so, I mean, I, I do it and, I, and I, I need to think through quite, and I haven't got the answer now, you know, about citizens' juries, citizens' conventions, you know, about how, how that's structured uh, and how they interface with one another. But I mean, the basic conception I'm completely behind. Thank you. And you mentioned there and that segues quite nicely on actually you know you mentioned there that politicians you know they are concerned with what the people think you know where the votes are coming from and you've talked a little bit about uh, the conservative party you know they're currently in government of course but we've had several comments which relate to the labor party how much do you think they are the way forward at the moment you know 
what can we do to encourage them to move faster on these issues? Um, I think the Labour Party, uh, uh, um, it's always been a coalition of the Labour Party between, you know, um, if you like, you know, elements of the kind of intellectual, educated, liberal middle class, and actually, you know, the organised working class, that's what it always was. Uh, and now they find themselves kind of desperately concerned, you know, they actually don't, they actually seem to be kind of repudiating their, their voters, um, you know, disparagingly about grad land and disparaging about, you know, they've only got graduates voting for them. Uh, they've got remainers and graduates and people who are progressive, kind of people who live in cities like Will Hutton, kind of in, you know, inclined. You know. And actually, it, the real people, the real people who matter are kind of, um, you know, um, uh, the kind of people who are unschooled or uneducated in, in the dying parts of Britain. That's who they want to represent. And I'm kind of, I'm, I must say, I'm astonished by it. I mean, I'm astonished by, uh, I mean, the coalition has to incorporate the people on this call and, um, you know, voters in Hartlepool. It shouldn't be one or the other. And, you know, and, and uh, again, I mean, I, 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 um, I mean, Keir Starmer, who I've occasionally talked to, I mean, he's very, I mean, and it's not a surprise. I mean, uh, you know, he's in the votes business. And actually, I think if they felt that their, that their, that their electoral base, um, um, I mean, they hold 11 out of 13 mayor mayoralities. Uh, and yet, you know, um, there are people like John Crudus uh, and Maurice Glasman and some of the people in the leader of the opposition's office, uh, like Jenny Chapman, um, who used to represent a red wall seat, who actually, you know, seem to be disparaging about that, you know. Oh, we only represent, you know, the, the, the people who are people who are interested in constitutional reform or want to revoke Remain uh, or work in high tech industries. Uh, we only seem to represent them, you know. We want to represent the sons and daughters of, of um, kind of, you know, honest to God, working class people. And I kind of, I, you know, I mean, my, my view is, is that, is that um, that's a blind, blind alley for Labour. Um, they need to talk about they need to talk about capitalism, and they need to talk about democracy. Uh, and actually, you know, um, your votes matter. And if your votes go off to the Liberal Democrats or to the Greens, um, you know, Labour um, will quickly move. Believe me. So, I mean, one of the things that will also make them move is a revived Liberal Democratic Party. I mean, I, if the Lib Dems could um, kind of um, be vocal on this that would happen and, and make some ground in local elections uh by elections uh that would also help but look i mean i um I, I, it's about um i some of you may be maybe skeptical about this but I, you know um you have voice you have agency all of you on this call and and uh uh, and, um, you know, uh, the parties that seek to represent you uh, need to speak to you. And actually, um, kind of, the, if, if when we can start to meet, if you hold a constitutional convention with uh, simultaneously in, in our major cities, you know, um, as has happened, as Charter 88 did in its kind of, in its pomp, if you can, can I mean, that was Charter 88, between 88 and 95, really made a difference. I mean, the, the, um, uh, we got very, very near changing the voting system and actually, uh, you know, um, elected mayors uh, uh, and, and, and regional assemblies and all of that, the Freedom of Information Act, all of that came out of Charter 88. You know, don't actually, uh, don't, you know, unlock democracy, uh, needs to be as vigorous um, as Charter 88 was in the day. And actually, Keir Starmer is going to have to notice. Um, so, you know, best foot forward, argue your heads off, argue your heads off, make a noise. Uh, and when the pandemic um, allows us, let's get together big time. Absolutely. Actually, just, uh, ju just pulling up on some of that about uh, the elected representatives, you know, directly elected mayors, you know, of course, there are plans in England for the directly elected mayors to go backwards in their voting system, you know, to be elected by first past the post again. And that's quite different to in Scotland where local councils have been elected 
um, by STV for years you know the Welsh Parliament have just said you know that local councils you know that they should decide their own system you know just as the same way that they choose their own council structure and they choose their own electoral cycle you know they should be free to choose their own electoral uh, system which is fair enough but here in England we seem to be going backwards I mean what <sighs> What do you think, what role do you think this plays with the written constitution? I mean, particularly where we've got England being the biggest of these countries. Well, look, I think this is another area where, I mean, um, I mean um, uh, another area where, again, I mean, it's difficult. I, I, I mean, I, I, you know, my instinct on this is as I, as I in my, in my uh -huh. presentation, is I'm not sure that uh, I would hang my, my advice to you is to not to hang my hat on there being uh, a constitutional convention where we rewrite Britain's constitution, lock, stock, and force making <laughs> barrels. I mean, uh, that, that may happen, we push for it. Um, but we actually, we're also opportunistic, you know, and we, and we take, and we, and, you know, we're always ready to kind of, Kind of launch an ambush or kind of capture some ground and, and i think that what the Tories are doing on trying to rewrite the voting system for mayors so it will advantage them mm -hmm. and is again a kind of an, another occasion to actually kind of open up an argument about voting and it you know and it may i i, I you know I, I, it's not likely that one's going to get um all the stakeholders in the british state to kind of align on all the things that I described uh, mm. in my presentation uh, at one moment in time, you know, what is what is likely is one is one is we'll make some progress on voting. What is likely is we'll make some progress on on um, standards in public life. What is likely is getting some checks and balances, and getting a, you know the House of Lords is plainly kind of an ab absurd, and even even Johnson recognizes that, and it, you know it'll it'll be. Uh, um, we may be lucky and get a great reforming government in 2024 or 2029 who wants to, I mean, if I led it, I would, you know, uh, I, I'd go for it. And I would regard uh, the coping stone of reforming government as the constitution. And, um, uh, and I think uh, Labour so badly need idealism. You know, this kind of, uh, you know, this kind of let's be sensible, let's be sure footed. Um, uh, let's not let's not be idealistic like Jeremy Corbyn. What a mistake that would be! I think that's again. I think it's a wrong road. <coughs> let's be idealistic, but let's be idealistic, you know, feasibly, you know, and the kind of things we talked about tonight are feasible. Excellent. Thank you. Just one last question before we go, and this is one from me, although I've been hearing some of this, you know, with the comments, you know, when we think about where we are at the moment and where we, we need to go, uh, think about how we speak truth to power. And at one end, we've got, you know, at one side of the, you know, the spectrum of speaking truth to power, we've got the gentle, you know, having discussions with those in authority. That's a form of speaking truth to power. Then at the other end, we've got a very loud, you know, shouting, uh, shouting truths, um, the kind of, you know, the protesting. And where do you think that we as a country need to stand at the moment? When we're getting these truths out and we're trying to speak our truth to power, do we need to be at the discussing end? Do we need to be at the protesting end? Where are we now? Well, um, clearly there are lots of nuances, but I mean, I, you know, when I when I look back at our history, I mean, you know, um, uh, kind of um, movements on voting required agitation, the Chartists uh, voting, and then the suffragettes. Um, you know, you imagine that you can make change that agitation, I think, is impossible. Um, um, I also think that um, since the war, uh, the some of the biggest change agencies in Britain have been political parties who haven't won power. Um, you know, you may want to think about founding a political party. I mean, <laughs> I mean, the uh, without the SDP, no new Labour, in my view. Uh, 
without, without um, UKIP and the Brexit party, very influential, even though they never won a seat in the House of Commons, either party. I mean, we wouldn't have today's Tory party, wouldn't have had the, leaving the European Union. You know, I mean, I, so, I mean, I do think, um, and those, you know, and, and Goldsmith and the referendum party, we used to laugh at it back in the early 1990s, it made a difference. So you have to find ways of agitating. You have to find ways of kind of giving political expression to you know what you think, and it, you can't be too nice about it either. I mean, you do have to rattle the cage, and it seems to me that you know the, the strategies don't are mutually, are mutually exclusive. I mean, I you know, I mean, uh, uh, maybe you know you, you should um, kind of fall under. Um, you know, the Queen's horse in the Derby. You know, I mean, um, you know, we, we haven't made these gains um, by kind of sitting on our hands and, mm -hmm. and, and, being, and playing patsy. And actually, I mean, I, I, I think the, I mean, my, you know, my, my, my wife has died now, but she was a great Green and Common campaigner. And I, she used to go off, you know, with the other women and, and pick it green and common. And actually, I, you know, it made a difference. It made a difference. Um, so I'm kind of, um, and actually, I mean, uh, my middle daughter, she's, you know, gay. And I think that, you know, she takes, it takes she's an activist and uh, it makes a difference. You know, she's made a difference. So I, I, I think that, you know, you, we, we can't make it um, too kind of, you know, sitting in a circle and holding hands and kind of having seminars and workshops, important though those are. I mean, let's have some citizens conventions and let's make it rowdy. Uh, um, you, you know, you, you know and, and sometimes you know, we'll, we'll try and operate within the law, of course. Um, and of course the law has been constrained to make it harder to be rowdy. Uh, mm -hmm. Another area in which I, which I you know, I, I'm, I, I fiercely against. So, I mean, there's my answer. Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, let's go and cause some serious annoyance to somebody then at some point <laughs> in the best law testing, you know, peaceful way that we possibly can. Thank you very much for everybody coming. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Will, um, for being such a good sport, for answering all those questions. Thank you, Tom, for asking the questions earlier. And Thank you everybody for being part of this. So thank you very much and we'll see you at one uh, soon. Bye. Bye and thank you for listening to me. I'm amazing, you know, so many people stayed on the line for so long. Thank you, I really appreciate it. Uh, really thank you. <laughs>